My guest today is the co-founder of that project. He's joining us today from Kansas uh, in the United States. Welcome, Marcin Jakubowski. Um, first question, because we're going to talk about it a lot and some of our audience might have heard of it. They might have some sense of what it is. Some of them may not have any idea what we're talking about. What's the 60 second elevator pitch of what is open okay. source? Okay, open source. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, open source. So open source refers to actually a development methodology. It's a word that came from the open source software movement. So open source means that the source, the code, the, the underlying blueprint is open. You can view it. There's actually four freedoms that exist in a formal, there's a, that's a formal definition of what open source means. And that means that you can inspect, use, modify, or sell the item like the software and for hardware we see we're getting into open source hardware which means that the blueprints are open source so you can see the the cad files the designs you can use them obviously to to build things from them like you can build our tractor from our blueprints if you have the skills uh, you can modify them so you can riff on that and t make new modifications on that and a very important part is also that you can sell that you can make a living doing that. So those are the four freedoms, the freedom of transparency, usage, modification. And the last one is economic freedom. And that's a big one because that that aims to address one of the main points that the current economy hasn't addressed yet. And that is distribution. We self production, but distribution is the key. So open source enables you to create economic activity as well. You're free to do that from the open source plans. So, uh, you know, in some ways, it's quite literal. It's open. It's open to use, it's, it's open, open to modify, for use. which and some people listening may find, you know, that, that, that may seem extremely unfamiliar to them um, based on whatever professions yeah. they're involved with or how they're used or accustomed to interacting in the world, whether that's with digital things or physical things. Uh, are there any yeah. famous, I mean, like, but, but how prevalent actually is it already? Are there any famous examples? We're going to talk a bit about the Global Village construction set, but are there things that are already mu very much open source in the market now? Yeah, there are there are open source hardware items. I mean, first of all, software has dominated uh, the world with open source. That's you're familiar with that. If you use Android, if you use Linux, all the back end of the internet is runs on open source servers. For hardware, uh, there are clearly good examples. For example, you may have heard of Arduino, the microcontroller, the three D printers. Uh, RepRap project that's basically created a whole 3D printing industry around the open source blueprints. There's things like open source machines like lasers, uh, cars, you name it. It applies to just about anything. And for us, it's it's about all the critical infrastructure tools of civilization. But it's uh, the the caveat there is if you look at the practical impact of that, you can say it's pretty much non-existent. I mean, as far as the entire impact on economy, it's, I would say it's around 100 million or so in economic activity, which is pretty much non-existent. I might, might be underestimating that a little bit, but even if it's 100 million, that's like one ten thousandth or 100 thousandth, just a very tiny, tiny fraction of the modern economy, which means that a lot of people just haven't heard of it. Can, can you explain that a little bit more for me? Because obviously when you're talking about Android and Linux there, even mm. 3D printers, um, those sound like quite big things, right? Uh, but but you're, you're saying actually they're they're, they're a speck on in the in the world that's not open source. I mean, yes, they are huge huge things. Like the three D printing industry right now is getting to billions. I think it's a couple of billion right now. There's a whole desktop manufacturing industry, and that may be like uh, around the hundred million dollar scale. Yes, 3D printers significantly have dominated that entire marketplace. Tons of new companies have started that were built on an open source RepRap project, like the biggest ones like Prusa Printers or Lulzbot. Those are fully open source companies. They publish their blueprints. Yet it's not a significant fraction if you take a look at the entire hundred trillion dollar economy. So if you take, I mean, it's way under a billion. Um, as far as the overall uh, impact that I would estimate for overall open hardware. So it's just at that very initial stage where it hasn't hit consciousness. It took about 20 years or so for Linux to dominate. It was 1991 that Linus Torvalds 
wrote his famous email announcing, hey, I'm going to make this operating system that runs on any computer, and it's going to be free, and you can work with it, you can play with it. Um, in about you know, 2010s, 2020, software has dominated, hands down. It took about a couple of decades. For hardware, we're much younger in a game, but I think it's, it's simply inevitable because as knowledge wants to be free, and as it, more capacity comes to public hands of things like digital fabrication, machines that are computer controlled, that allow you to, do, to build things on a smaller scale using computer aided assist, that changes the game. So it's just coming out, but it's not, not making a huge economic impact yet. It's one of those things that uh, I think are a future trend. So we're definitely going to talk a bit more about that and also how it overlaps with the circular economy. But before we dive into that, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a, there are a couple of things I wanted to pick up on. Um, there's this distinction between soft, software and hardware. Your, the project that I mentioned in my intro, which you've, uh, you've been working on, the Global Village construction set, that's very much a hardware-based open source. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah. that and its ambitions? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're designing open blueprints for everything from a tractor to an oven to a circuit maker, CNC machinery, energy so, production equipment, so even just homes. So understand that, right? There's a blueprint potentially yeah. on your, your platform that if I wanted to try and figure out how do I build a tractor, which seems yeah. like quite a big yeah. project, and, and, and actually yeah. maybe I'm not the right person, but um, it seems like quite a big project. I, I, yeah. you, I could go from step one of you know, not having any materials, not having any idea how to build a tractor to having a finished tractor if, you know, if I can develop certain skills, I guess, and get access to everything. Yes, absolutely. Uh, back in 2012, we published our first iteration of the Civilization Starter Kit DVD. And in it, we had the full mm -hmm. blueprints for the tractor, brick press, power cube, salt for press, few, few critical machines. But the idea is publish the exact blueprints, CAD, bills of materials, build instructions that allow anybody with a basic tool set to replicate that on a small scale. So yes, sharing the underlying source code, the, for, for machines, it's primarily the blueprints, the CAD, computer-aided design files that now you can share digitally around the world. And, and just to understand how basic the skill set is that someone needs, and I guess the other question in the back yeah. of my mind is how much does it cost? you know, to, to, uh, to build a tractor from scratch. Yeah, for example, for our tractor, the, the 5,000 pound machine that we build, that's it's about $10,000 in materials. It might cost you several times that to buy a ready-made tractor. Um, and that advantage actually increases, like if you talk about a much bigger tra tractor that might co cost you a quarter million dollars, we think we can build one of those for about 30,000 in materials. So as we go up, you can also get that. But, but as far as uh, get a better advantage, the, the, the more you scale, scale it up. Uh, as far as the, um, let's see, losing my track of mind here. So as far as the kinds of skill set required, for example, for the tractor or brick press, if you can do things like welding, torching, using a drill press, using basic power tools like grinders, uh, and if you learn a skill set, you can do that. You can go right now, download our blueprints, which we encourage you to do, uh, build the thing, and iterate on it. But obviously, that's a big endeavor, and that's part of the reason why uh, the project is not spreading yet. I mean, we ha we've we've gone quite a quite a way. But the viral replication that we were predicting very early on, it hasn't happened. Like, for example, in 2008, we produced our first brick press that was pretty much industrial grade, could meet or exceed the competition, was about 5,000 in materials, whereas, whereas the next competitor, you would pay like 50,000 for a brick press of that same throughput. Uh, a, a brick press is a machine that compresses dirt to make building blocks. But in that case, I thought, OK, wow, we did it. This is going to spread all over the world. Uh, but it hasn't. It's, it's, I think because it's, it's hard. And I think the level of access, the quality of the instructionals or providing kits, which, which we actually haven't really done yet so much, uh, it really takes that, you know, dropping those access barriers by doing things like doing kits um, and other things of productization. Now, taking the items from basically like one-off projects to viable products that can can compete in the marketplace. That's our next step. So we're basically doing that step right now, where we're focusing much more on the enterprise aspect, 
uh, because I actually read one interesting article uh, yesterday. This is by uh, Open and Bold, the guy, guy in Europe. But he's saying, well, there's one big thing that a lot of open source <laughs> projects have for forgotten, and that is a product. <laughs> yes, you got to get to that product stage where you're actually selling it, uh, getting the financial feedback loops into the system so you can bootstrap on further or just increase the development. We obviously can talk more about what's next, and I mean, you've already hinted towards that, but I also want to go back in time a little bit and just ask, what made you think that, what made you decide to do this? What made you think, what I'm going to do is create the blueprints for everything you need to build your own village? Well, I, I like to consider myself a world changer. The farther I went in my, I got a PhD in plasma physics and I discovered I was useless as a result of that. I didn't feel like I was going to make any difference in the world, so I just uh, cut out of that, started a farm in Missouri, and uh, any experiment. So I wanted to do some kind of a world changing experiment. I knew I wanted to get into some agriculture and having land was the critical thing. So I, I started a farm. And then pretty soon after that, I found that uh, you need some equipment. I mean, if once you you are for, you are put up against nature and the, the concept of trying to reboot civilization from scratch or fixing a lot of its issues, you have to go back to the material resource base. And that's part of the reason for the farm. But you, you find that you get get whooped by nature and by the idea that you need some serious equipment, productive equipment to make industrial productivity happen on a small scale. Uh, so I bought a tractor, and that's a story that I talk about in my TED Talk. I bought a tractor, then it broke. I paid to get it repaired, and it broke again, and pretty soon I was broke too. So that's when uh, the idea of the Global Village Construction Set came up. We first did the brick press uh, to build our own housing. But then I noticed that, wow, okay, these machines here, like the tractor, they are expensive. They break down and they break you if you do not, do not have tech control over that technology. And, and you do not. If you do not, um, if it's not open source, you don't really own it. You can't really repair it. You might not be able to get parts. Um, so open source is one of those key enabling principles that allows you to do to do an economically viable operation and do so at a low cost where you don't get surprises like now your equipment breaks and you're either out of time in a shop, say, which is a catastrophe if you, for example, got to collect, harvest your crop, or just the fact that the parts are so expensive. So that was exactly the case. I paid 1500 bucks for a, for a repair that took took a week. And then the week after that, the tractor broke again. It was like, wow, okay, I cannot do this. So it absolutely breaks the bank. So I had to. Uh, I figured I had to solve it, and I f figured that if I'm going to solve it for myself, why not solve it for everybody in this world? Because I was sure that many, many people are in the same position. Um, Martin, uh, we were just there getting into the topic of competitive versus collaborative, and what I find really interesting about yeah. that, I think, is that there's maybe an insinuated idea that the competitive ownership of um, the IP patents, etc is part of making things better and competition. and But actually, if you, when you dig deeper into that, it, uh, and I think uh, we were talking off air, that, that the numbers behind it don't really support it. There's a, the example, we talked a bit about 3D printing earlier, and I understand that actually that industry kind of that we just talked about being a huge industry needed to be open source to take off. Is that is that fair? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right with the 3D printer. The idea there was, and what was it? I think was it 2004 or so, where the patents ran out and a whole, the whole, the RepRap project started around that time where a bunch of people got together, started designing 3D printers off the expired patents and came up with the wealth that exists today in terms of dominating the marketplace mm -hmm. with open source 3D printers. Just about any 3D printer out there, uh, most of the printers out there are open source, but we should go back. So you said about, okay, is proprietary good or is, is collaborative good? Uh, you can argue for both ways, and there's certainly data that shows early in history how patents have suppressed innovation. So let's take a look at an example of that. Back in the Industrial Revolution, when Watt's uh, steam engine came out, uh, he had a monopoly on that and, and held it for some time until the patent ran out. And you can see, if you study that historical example, you'll see that a group after that, uh, after the patents expired, started a journal, started sharing openly, and the efficiency of the, the subsequent steam engines was doubled in a visible time frame. So 
you can study that as a clear case where the patents were simply suppressing innovation, then a little bit more openness came about and, and statistically significant improvement in efficiency has occurred. And it's not just a freak event. Oh, maybe they just, you know, the efficiency kind of went up because it had to go up. No, it's, it's, it's a, I think when you look at the data carefully, you can trace that to the lockdown with the patents. So you want to get away from that. The big picture for us. So we're developing the global village construction set, but we're interested more broadly than that in a generalized open source product development pipeline and methodology that we can use. So our big, big question is, how do we convert the current economy from proprietary to collaborative? And that's that's the big picture. We see a lot of uh, competitive waste. So things like you mentioned, the patents and everything else, we think that's not contributing to humanity. We think that there's a whole new level that we can achieve by open collaboration, which really does not exist today. And, and there's an intuition, right, that more minds, you know, will make it easier to solve problems mm -hmm. or to make things yeah. better or more efficient. I mean, it, it's not that we all sort of acknowledge that, uh, but we don't necessarily apply it in the way in which we develop the most valuable tools in our society. Um, is that, is that, I mean, is, is, is yeah, that yeah. A, I mean, I, to that? comment on that, the, the case has been made crystal clear with software. Right now, everybody does open source. Uh, Microsoft is the number one supporter of open source software today. Now, Microsoft, if you remember its history, was the biggest. Uh, they, they basically called Linux, the open source software, a plague. <laughs> they were scared of it. They were thinking it's going to crush the entire economic system. But now they endorse it fully. The case is clear. You collaborate on a very complex thing that it simply makes sense for a lot of people to collaborate on. And then you build your proprietary, you know, they still build proprietary business models on top of that, like Amazon or Google or Facebook. Those are all derivatives of open source. All their backends and software infrastructure are open source. Now, why can we not translate that success to hardware? Well, there's definitely one, it's much harder because there's atoms involved, not electrons, that atoms cost. And we also have the incumbency of 200 years of industrial history, which show that proprietary was the way to go. We have not broken for that. There's a lot of mental inertia that says, oh, that's always been like that. Some people consider that, oh, it's just a law of nature. No, it's not. It's completely negotiable. And that's the, the project we're working on. And uh, this, is a, this is especially relevant as we, um, I mean, here at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we reflect on the idea that we need to transition away from a take-make-waste linear economy to a, mm -hmm. an economy that designs out waste and pollution, that keeps materials and products in use, that's regenerative by design. Um, yeah, absolutely. So that's, and and, uh, and I, do, I know that you have this, you feel that open source is actually a really key. So as we think about how do we shift the economic model, open source is a really key and a, a part of that picture. Right. I think that open source is a simply a prerequisite to the circular economy for the because of the lifetime design issue. So the only way you're going to get to lifetime design, meaning you can reuse it, you can modify it, you can fix it, you have to have the blueprints for that. So uh, one of my um, encouragements for the the circular economy community, which is which is pretty much. No, I mean, we're, we're all into regenerative design. But in a discourse within the, the circular economy community, I do not hear enough of the open source equation. Um, yes, it's mentioned, but where are the products so far that, that uh, we can make from open blueprints? In the open hardware community, there's very few that, I mean, outside of 3D printers, uh, there's very little open design. Like besides us, I mean, nobody has really has an open source tractor or, any other other machines so it's it's very rare uh so my my take-home message here is we need to make open source essential in the circular economy equation and i know that that word is mentioned but i think it needs to be the like the core the the two two things they gotta link up completely